Thank you all for coming. We are uh, hosting today our first of what will be a series of town hall meetings that we anticipate will be on a monthly basis as we go through the uh, George Mason High School campus project. We're calling them the Sunday series, and uh, so welcome. Uh, my name is Wyatt Shields. I'm the city manager for the City of Falls Church, and uh, today's, uh, what we intend to do today is about 20, 25 minutes of information out, and then Q&A, and we anticipate that today's session will last anywhere between an hour and an hour and a half, or as long as it needs to go in terms to, of responding to questions to you. Um, let me invite uh, Mayor Tarter forward to, uh, to make some introductions, and, and before I hand it over to him, <coughs> I'll just note that we do have a number of city council members here. We have Vice Mayor Mary Beth Connolly, who is here. Uh, we have Council Member Ross Lipkenhouse in the back, and Phil, uh, Council Member Dave Snyder is in the back, Council Member Phil Duncan here to the, uh, on your right side, and uh, Council Member Letty Hardy. And so as we get into the Q&A, um, I will answer questions, Dr. Noonan will answer questions, but our Council Members uh, can answer questions uh, as well. So we'll all join in uh, to work together. And Dr. Noonan will introduce our school board members in just a moment. But Mayor Tarter. Sure, thank you very much. Um, welcome to all of you and thank you for coming out. Are we supposed to be using the microphone, by the way? Yeah, we, uh, uh, this is taped for, uh, for rebroadcast. And so we're using microphones. When we get to Q&A, we'll use the microphones as well for the folks at home. Yeah, so anyway, I want to thank you all for coming out on a, a kind of rather bland day. Um, this is really important to the future of our city. It's critically important what we're about to undertake. And we are getting really to really f uh, ready to full start the um, formal process. You know, we've been talking about this for a period of years now, and we're really getting, kind of getting underway. So um, we want to make sure you're informed. Council's made a commitment to the public to make sure that you're as informed as possible, that the process is as transparent as possible, and we give you as many opportunities to participate, to offer input, guidance, feedback, um, as we can. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. That's a commitment we've made to you, and we're gonna continue to honor that as we go forward. And as Wyatt said, the idea is to have as many public meetings and opportunities for you to uh, hear information and offer input as possible. So as we go along, there'll be a schedule. I guess the schedule's not out yet. Is it wide of public meetings going forward? Uh, we, we have a schedule that goes through um, April. And then after that, we're, we, we'll, we'll still do it on a monthly basis. But as we get into the summer months, we want to make sure we pick a date that's the most um, convenient as possible. So we haven't scheduled the actual dates past May. Okay, but we will be. And as we do, we'll make sure you're aware of the schedule. And we'd like you to be able to participate as you're doing what you're going to do today as well. Um, we are trying to make this as open a process as possible. There are some limitations under law. You need to understand that. Um, and so not everything we do will be made public. And there are things that are happening that really are meetings that are private or whatever. And sometimes you may say, why, is it, why aren't you doing this? You know, we probably are, but it, it's not something we talk about every possible thing that we're doing. But in, as, in as general rule, we're going to try to make this as open a, a process as we can. Um, so... I'm not sure what else to say other than uh, we thank you and we look forward to continuing dialogue with all of you. So with that, I should turn it over to Peter. Peter? You can keep the microphone, okay. Mr. Mayor. I've got all one right. right here. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for uh, being here. Uh, for those of you that I haven't had an opportunity to meet, my name is Peter Noonan. I'm the superintendent of schools here in the city of Falls Church. Very excited to be here. Um, I've now turned the corner, I think, on eight months, um, and, so I, and, and we're just cooking along and having a great time. Um, like the city council members, we have a number of school board members here as well today. I'd like to recognize them. Greg Anderson is here. We have Shannon Linton, and we have Shauna Russell, and I think I saw Aaron Gill. Aaron Gill is here. Uh, anyone I'm missing? All right. Well, thank you all for being here as well. And so as we answer the questions, we certainly want to uh, provide as, as robust an answer as we possibly can. Um, Mr. Shields has, has done a nice job of sort of outlining the timing, um, all in an effort to try to limit my comments. So I will do my best. I'll do my best to uh, stay within the time frame, but I do want to share some information with you. Um, there's been a couple of. Uh, this is a very exciting time. Let me just start with that. I I have. Um, I feel as though I've sort of died and gone to school heaven because I get to come to the city of Falls Church and work with this community on doing some things that every superintendent I think really dreams of, and that is opening a brand new building, having an opportunity to work closely with the community, work closely with students. 
um, and the like to, to really do some powerful things that will help take our schools from the 20th century into the 21st century, even though we're 18 years into the 21st century. But we're taking a 20th century building and sort of building upon that. And that's very exciting. Um, there have been a number of opportunities for our community to engage already around some visioning uh, for the last several years, almost decade of the high school. Um, and that's exciting as well. So, so we're not starting from scratch or from ground zero. We're really starting from a place of having a sense of what the building could look like and should look like going forward. I want to start just by talking briefly about the PPEA process. And it came up, um, as, as Mayor Tarter mentioned, around transparency and versus confidentiality and sort of balancing the two of those uh, ideas. And we have used uh, effectively the PPEA process a number of times in the city of Falls Church historically to build our buildings. So for example, um, Jesse Thackeray, um, the first edition at Thomas Jefferson, the current Mount Daniel project, were all PPEA processes. Um, and as a consequence of that, as I've sort of looked at the difference between the PPEA process and a design bid build process, one of the things that we've discovered in that, and, and why I think the PPEA process is really powerful is because it does provide more transparency than any other kind of design bid build process might. So an example of that is right now we are in the middle of um, reviewing the RFP conceptual, um, the conceptual uh, pieces that the design and build companies have provided to us that are interested in building the new high school. Um, by the PPEA um, adopted process that the school board has in place, we have to post online within 10 days of getting those, um, those bids, we have to post them online. So on January 31st, all of the proposals minus the proprietary information that um, these companies are allowed to redact will be posted online. That doesn't always happen in the design bid build process. So with respect to transparency, one of the things that we want to try to make sure to do in this PPA process is to give you as much information as we possibly can to provide as many opportunities as possible to give us input. Um, and so to, to that end, one of the things I just want to say up front is please, uh, if you have any questions about any of the project going, any of this project that's going on, go to our uh, Falls Church City Public Schools website. Um, we have, a, right on our front page, we have the George Mason High School Project. We've put everything in there, links to meetings that we've had. We've got all of the, uh, all of the materials that we've handed out at meetings. We've got all the PowerPoints we've delivered. All of that information is in there, so I would invite you to see that. If you don't remember to go to the schools, but you go to the city uh, website, the general government site, one of the really great things that we've tried to do is link the two sites together. So there's a button on the general government side that says, do you want to read more about the school project? Click here, and it takes you over to the school site. So we're trying to really interface. So I wanted to say that up, up front about the PPA process, because I know that's been one of the things that's come up a number of times. So let me give you a little update about where we are. Um, as, as many of you know, uh, in November, um, our request for proposals for the conceptual phase of the process went out. Um, and we have uh, gotten some, of, we've gotten those back. Um, that bid closed on January 17th. And so we're starting now to look at the companies that, and there were five that were responsive to us um, in terms of uh, who would like to come and do the design build. And so as we review those, and there's a team of folks that have come together that are reviewing those, we will then um, down select to likely three from the five. Um, by February 20th, actually, is the date that that will be announced at a school board meeting. Um, they will adopt the three finalists that will move forward in the full design process RFP. So I want to make sure that you know that date right off, the, right off the top. And then the full RFP will be delivered to those three finalists on February 22nd um, for review. That doesn't, uh, and let me, let me also say, just to sort of help manage the input piece, that doesn't mean that there still won't be input between now and when we build this high school starting next summer, not this coming summer, but the following summer, opportunities for people to give input about the design. There's gonna be a lot of opportunities, lots of meetings to do that with our, with our finalists um, and through this process. So we've held a number of meetings already, one around design input, um, and we held it on December 13th. We had a community interactive briefing. I think many of you are in the room were there. Um, I think it was very helpful. There we looked at some, some of the design input and we looked at the responses and we had a number of breakout areas that you could go to. 
around curriculum and instruction, about environmental, about uh, environmental sustainability, around the arts, sports, and the like. Um, and from that, um, we heard a number of concerns. And I want to talk about each of these kind of quickly, because I don't want uh, to spend all the time this morning, or this afternoon, Wyatt, um, dealing with this. But I do want to make sure that everyone understands that we took all of the feedback from that meeting verbatim and have put all of that information up on our website as well, so you can see what was said. And we have been responding to each of those concerns along the way. Um, so recently, we had a, a number of meetings with the performing arts folks because that was one of the questions that came up. Can you talk a little bit more about the design of the Performing Arts Center um, and the capacity of the building, the size of the stage, the, the um, size of our practice rooms and the like? So the, one of the first things we talked about was the auditorium size. And I, and I want to just um, say up front, I was, the, um, I was fortunate enough to be the superintendent of schools in the city of Fairfax. Uh, for five years and the city of Fairfax has one of the largest performing arts centers in all of Fairfax County and the surrounding jurisdiction. It seats just, just over a thousand people. Um, prior to being in Fairfax City for five years, for 12 years prior, I was in um, Fairfax County Public Schools and was the assistant superintendent for instruction before I was superintendent in the city of Fairfax. I've been in and, at, in and out of Fairfax High School on any number of occasions for every potential performing arts uh, program that they've put on and not once has that thousand seat auditorium ever been filled and that's a city of 22,000 people and these programs are really great. So one of the questions that came up around uh, uh, size of auditorium is, is it the right size because we're calling for between 650 and 700 seats. That, in our um, estimation, as we've looked at an analysis of all the surrounding schools that have been redone recently, whether it's Wakefield, Yorktown, some of the other schools and the like, seems to be just the right number for us to be able to have not only a strong performing arts center for our students, but also a great community space for us to be able to do shows and plays and the like. Um, so we are, we're kind of sticking to where we found that that was the best or the right size comparatively. But I did want um, folks to know that brought up the concern about the auditorium size that we did do an analysis of that and looked at it very closely. On January 3rd, we met with the staff in the visual and the performing arts as well um, and talked to them about some other things. And some of the things that we talked about were the shape of the stage. You might, if you were at that original briefing, one of the things you saw was that it was a square stage as opposed to a rectangular stage that the stage was actually smaller than the existing stage. So we've made some modifications in our ed specifications, which are folded into the RFP um, around that. So those changes have been made and will be part of the new RFP. There have been a number of questions about parking and transportation. That was something that came up in our meetings as well. Um, and one of the things that I, I think is gonna be important for all of us to sort of try to get our heads around as best we can is that this is, not your, this is not your parents' high school, right? This is gonna be a remarkably different high school than what we experienced as kids coming through. Um, it is an, a semi-urban setting uh, because it is in a city which dictates that there are some changes that we need to make with respect to transportation and parking. Um, and so I anticipate that there will be enough parking spaces for the staff and there will be parking spaces for students as well. There may just not be as many as there are currently. So it means that we have to sort of revision, revision a little bit how our kids are getting to and from school. There may be a premium that we might be able to provide to kids that carpool. There may be some other opportunities and options for us to look at, looking at um, other transportation modes as well. So that has been um, one of the conversations that's come on. Another question that came up was about the, the site itself. Is it, is it okay for the high school and the middle school to be in such a, what might be considered a compacted site? And we looked at the test fit um, a while ago, and I think everybody's seen um, the test fit that was done by Perkins Eastman. And we've, we've determined that where that building sits is really um, best, not only for the site, but it provides us with some pretty significant synergies between the middle school, Henderson, and also with the high school. One of the things that we're really interested in doing is allowing our middle school kids to take high school courses and to be able to flex back and forth in that close proximity really gives us a great opportunity to look at that. Green space is super important to us. Um, we recognize that um, the City of Falls Church is Tree City USA. It's part of our moniker, it's part of who we are. Um, we, we look at school sites and uh, really want to adjust uh, how we landscape and the like to meet the needs of the broader community. 
The tricky piece about being a school is that we have tons of fields, right? We have ball fields, we have practice fields, and then the, the footprint of the school is, re is really large as well, both Henderson and the high school, and then the amount of impervious space with respect to where people park and the walkways and the streets limit to some extent how many trees we can plant there. However, um, the Tree Commission has sent us a, a really nice letter saying we respectfully request that you consider putting a tree canopy of 20% into the RFP. I don't know that we'll be able to ever get to 20% because of the way the, the site is with the amount of green space that's there for fields and the like, but we have added some language into the RFP that, su that suggests that we will give preference to um, a design build company that provides uh, for, um, for leveraging the space that we have to provide as many trees as possible. So we are really trying to figure out how we can get as many trees onto that site as we possibly can. Um, preserving our legacy, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I, I just said on one hand that, you know, we, 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 this is not your parents' high school, um, but we also recognize that there's a history in the high school as well, whether it's the Memorial Gardens, whether it's the Mustang in the hallway that many of you in here have walked across before, um, whether it's plaques on the walls, and, and I want to just say out loud to everybody in this room today, we are really committed to working on preserving those monuments and memorials through this process. I believe that one of the really beautiful things that can happen with this new high school is one, it, is it, it's new and it's exciting and it's fresh, but it also recognizes the history of Falls Church. And I think one of the ways that we can recognize the history is through that process of preserving some of those legacy and memorial items that we have. So I've been speaking with Cecily Shea from um, the Ed Foundation and working with some other people and we're, we're developing a process by which, uh, well, let me just say this, I wanna thank those of you that already um, already have done an inventory of all of those that are there. So we already have a comprehensive list of all of the memorials, all the plaques, all the benches um, and the like. And now we get to work with our um, contractor as we move forward uh, about um, how we're gonna present those and whether it's a memorial garden, whether it's a memorial wall, I don't know what it's gonna be, but it's an opportunity for us to really think about how we bring forward the legacy and memorial but continue moving ahead. I talked about the tree canopy a little bit. Community use is something else that's come up. Um, and, and I wanna, again, just sort of say out loud, we are absolutely committed to finding a way to make this high school a community use building. It's the center and the heart of, it's not the heart of the community because of where it resides on the west side, but it certainly can be a community center and we want it to be a community center. So if you look at the design that was originally done just with respect to it being a test fit, one of the things you, you may have noticed in that design is when you walk in the main doors, instantly you've got the cafeteria, you've got the auditorium, you've got the gym separated from the academic bar, the academic wing that can, be, that can be blocked off. So that opens up all of the opportunities there to use our gyms, to use our media center, to create synergy between the Mary Riley, Riley Stiles Library and ours, using our auditorium, using our cafeteria. So not only are we gonna build for that, but we're also gonna build a process for that as well. Right now, what we know is that it's very difficult. I, I think it's difficult at best for anyone who's interested in using the building to figure out how to use it. Um, so we'd like to clean that process up, make it more clear, make it more transparent, easier to use the building. Um, and so that will be certainly part of our planning also. Talked a lot about athletics um, and, and the new um, design of what that facility could look like. Um, I think what we've landed on is very responsive to the needs of the community. Um, I see Julie, where are you? There you are. Um, our, our, great, uh, our great athletic booster, not the only one, lots of them. Um, but we, we are really feeling good about um, the design that's been put in place for the high school. We will have a competition sized gym. There'll be appropriate um, auxiliary gym and other spaces for wrestling and uh, track and, and the like. Um, and we're excited about the potential for bringing some community from outside the City of Falls Church into our community as well, because we'll be able to host some of the larger events um, regionally, which I think is very exciting. And last was that there was a group that was meeting to talk about net zero and sustainability. Um, we made a very clear comment in our um, RFP conceptual phase that the building had to be at minimum lead gold and had to be net zero ready. Um, and we're starting to see the fruits of, of our labor coming out in some of these uh, responses from the design build companies that, are, that have submitted. Again, those will be public on the 31st so you can start to see. 
Um, we did want to get to net zero ready, but we also said in the RFP that there, was, there would be a premium given to those companies that would help us achieve full net zero. And so we're starting to see some language in these conceptual designs that begin to achieve that. Um, so we're really excited about the input that we got from our community on those dates. Um, we had another meeting on the 28th, uh, which is today. Um, and then we've got a couple other opportunities for public comment around the RFP. On the 13th, we have a school board meeting. There'll be a co uh, public comment that, that day. And then on the 20th, we'll also have an opportunity for public comment. And that's when we down select the three finalists uh, for, for our proposals. So then we move into the design process. And again, uh, February 22nd is when we will let the RFP for proposers um, to do their full detailed proposal. Um, and by the way, one of the things that we know about this, and this is just sort of a, something that's more informational than anything, is that when we cut to um, however many we cut to, whether it's two or three or four finalists, if you do the math, it's you have a 33% chance or a 25% chance or a 50-50 chance of getting this award. Those design companies that will continue in this process are committing to spending about $200,000 to $250,000 on our design. So these companies are taking on a significant risk um, to stay with us past this conceptual phase. And so we're, we're really excited because we've got five high quality companies and we're, we're confident that they'll stick with us through the process. Um, and then on May 17th, the final RFP detailed proposals are due. And we will down select to a finalist then uh, in, in the May-June timeframe and negotiate a contract at that point. And then the world sort of opens up to all of us to continue the conversations about here's the, here's the design, now let's tweak it. Let's figure out what's missing, what do we need to have, is there mo are there modifications that need to be made, et cetera. So just in terms of our milestones, just kind of moving along this um, process, I've sort of spoken to them, but that yellow line that just kind of popped up there is kind of where we are. Um, we'll move into selection. And then construction uh, will begin in July of 2019. We expect to break ground. So with that, I will turn it over to my friend after I've spent all of your time talking. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I get 30 seconds. Wyatt Shields. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, so I'm, you know, today is a day not for the pres presentation of plans and to engagement, roll up our sleeves and do design work. Really, today is a, a discussion about the schedule and about the process and how people can participate in that process. But if you look at the campus, sort of the big idea that we're pursuing is uh, to build a new high school and to bring up to 10 acres of land to, for commercial uses to help us pay for that high school. And so conceptually, this is the work we did last year. We laid out a conceptual plan where this is where the school, high school is today. We build our new school uh, here conceptually, have a buffer then of our playing field between uh, the school and uh, economic development that would really center on the Haycock and Route 7 uh, intersection. So the, the process that I will describe this afternoon is a process very similar to what Peter just described, but is a process to uh, market, entitle, and solicit uh, bids for the 10 acres uh, on, on the campus property. Um, the reason we need to do this, um, you know, in terms of our goals that we've articulated is A, to uh, have outstanding design and create a great place. Um, but it's also to raise revenue and fundamentally, um, you know, our strategy for over three years as we've been thinking about this is when we look at the cost of a new high school, uh, what they cost is about $120 million and that's our cost estimate that's based on, on a pretty detailed review of, of what these costs are likely to be as, as we go through the process that Peter's described. And so the way we would finance that is through three different debt issuances. This spring we will issue the first tranche of debt for approximately $10 million which will get us through architecture and engineering. And then the key inflection point of the entire project would be uh, approximately June or July of next summer, 16 months from now, when we would have negotiated a guaranteed maximum price for the high school and we'll have also executed a land transaction with a private developer for the 10 acres. Both of those are precedent to 
the issuance of the first construction loan, which is anticipated to be $60 million, and then the second construction loan, uh, which would be a year later in 2020. Now, those numbers may modify a little bit based on the advice we're getting from, from our financial advisor, but that's the basic idea in terms of how we would issue debt for the high school project. And so these numbers will be familiar uh, as we, uh, for those who were paying close attention during the referendum. Um, but to pay for the $120 million high school, to pay for it in the traditional way uh, without the economic development piece, that would be the equivalent of a thousand of dollars for the average homeowner increase <coughs> on your property tax bill, uh, which is the equivalent of 15 cents on the real estate tax rate. With the economic development, um, the way we have modeled this, uh, we, we believe that, uh, that that would be reduced uh, approximately $280 for the average homeowner or the equivalent of about four cents on the tax rate. And that's based on a whole set of assumptions, which I won't go into detail. I'll be happy to discuss during Q&A. Uh, but that, that is the power of the economic development piece uh, in terms of the overall uh, planning for this high school. We've recognized from the beginning of this planning process that to build a new high school is a tremendous undertaking for a city of our size and with a tax base of our size as well. So in terms of, uh, of schedule, uh, Peter described the schedule uh, on the school, uh, for the school project. And here we have the, the schedule that's, that takes the two processes and, and puts them side by side so you can see how the two interact with each other. And this is the handout that was at the table when you walked in. Uh, but so for, uh, for this column, we have the steps in the high school project procurement process. And in this column, we have the steps for the economic development. And for each of the steps, the economic development piece is about three months or so behind the school design piece, and that's, that's intentional. Uh, so the schools have already issued their request for conceptual proposals, um, and will issue the request for detailed proposals in the February time frame, and intend, intentionally uh, would, would select the school design and construction team in June of 2018. On the economic development side, we intend to issue our request for conceptual proposals uh, on March 1, um, uh, and then the uh, shortlist the respondents to that um, with, a, uh, with a request for detailed proposals, which we would issue in June. Um, those would be due in August, and our intention would be to select the top-ranked developer partner for the 10 acres in the October timeframe which would give us approximately six months as the school design is being finalized, uh, six months to finalize a land lease agreement and a conceptual development plan for the, uh, for the 10 acres. And again, uh, those agreements then the, with entitlements for the property and a land lease, uh, which is our preferred structure, a long-term land lease uh, agreement with the developer would be finalized prior to issuance of the construction bonds, which is, our, is targeted for June of 2019. So that is a lot to get done over the next 16 months. Um, we've been preparing for it, and uh, we believe we can achieve it. So on, on the economic development side, two key documents for the public to pay close attention to and to weigh in on is the, uh, the request for conceptual proposals and we did have uh, copies of that draft that are uh, on, the, on the table in the back. I don't know if there are any left, or if they've been all picked up. Um, and, and then subsequently, in, in, uh, in the June time frame, the, develop, uh, the request for detailed proposals. But in those documents is where the city articulates what are our goals for the 10 acres. And that's where we will articulate uh, what our, our needs are on the revenue side, on the placemaking side, we'll spell out in some con and, and, and probably at a high level what our thoughts are in terms of uses, in terms of density, um, and in terms of values. A couple of things that we've we've articulated is that we we do want this to be a special place. Uh, we want it to be a place that recognizes the fact that um, uh, students are going to walk through it twice a day. We want it to be very walkable. We want it to be 
um, a place that people will enjoy visiting and, and passing through. We also think it's very important uh, that probably the, the main hook to this property, yes, it's a great loca lake location. It's well served by transit, well served by I-66. It has great visibility for retail and commercial uses. But it's also next to UVA and Virginia Tech, and it's also next to our high school. And we think that uh, there are opportunities where the private sector can embrace that educational uh, proximity and have that be um, an important part of their thinking about this site as well. Uh, so some of the uses that we think would be appropriate, um, office uses uh, would be appropriate, retail uses would be appropriate, a hotel use is something that we think would be um, appropriate and good for the site, good for the city. Um, and we do think that it will need to be a mixed-use development, that it will need to have a residential component to it. Um, what we will ask the market is, for people who are interested, interested in this property, we would like, we will rate most highly those that have a commercial approach to the site and understand that residential might be an, a, a needed ingredient to make it work from a financial perspective and also to add energy and, and life to it, um, uh, you know, 18 hours a day. Um, but we want people with a commercial um, mindset of, um, approaching this site. Um, commercial first with a residential uh, component to it. So those are some of the ideas that we'll articulate in, in, the, uh, in the request for conceptual proposals. Um, from that then we'll shortlist what we anticipate would be no more than four uh, of, of the top ranked developers to participate in the second round which is the, the detailed proposals. And very similar to what Peter said, uh, these are very expensive proposals to respond to. So if you're going to participate in the round two, you do want to know that it's not, you're not competing against 20, that you're competing against a short list. So three or four will probably be the number that we pass on uh, to the second round. Um, so really the, the next 16 months is very critical for the whole project. Then you have the two-year period where the school is constructed. And over that two-year period, our, our private partner then will go through the site plan approval process, in the building permit process, obtain financing, and then would take possession of the 10-acre site um, after the new school is, is, uh, is occupied. Um, so that's the, the, the sort of the key milestones of, of the process. As we mentioned at the very beginning, um, we will have monthly town hall updates similar to this, information out, Q&A, and discussion, comments, suggestions, um, advice, uh, we need it all, uh, but uh, February 25th will be the, the proposed next uh, town hall meeting. Then on March 18th and April 8th, we'd like to combine our project updates with input on the budget as well because they are actually very closely linked and we're building our FY19 uh, budgets very much with this capital project in mind and the CIP is going to be the main, uh, the main thing in the FY19 budget in many respects. Um, we're trying to, as, as Peter described, have our two websites be very closely linked on this project so they'll have a very similar look on the, on the sort of the home pages for the projects and then you can go and follow the economic development uh, line to learn information about that and the, uh, the school uh, button to learn more about um, the, the progress on, on the high school site. So that's a quick overview of the schedule and the process that we're undertaking. So right now uh, the council is looking at the draft uh, request for conceptual proposals and so uh, we're getting that draft. We, we intend to issue it on March 1st so we've got about a month uh, of more work on it. Um, and we will get that out uh, on the web page once some, so we have a few other sort of structural things we need to do with it, uh, but we'd like people's comment on that document. So we'll stop there, and uh, now we'd like to open it up for Q&A unless you had other... I just wanted to welcome Justin Castillo, another school board member that joined us. Otherwise... So for, for the questions, what we will do is um, ask you to ask your question in the microphone, again, for the, for the taping. Mr. Stevens. Uh, thank you. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the city and the schools uh, outlined a uh, kind of a managerial structure 
uh, with the coordinating committee and uh, also something called the task groups. Yes. And so I've got a question for both of you on these task groups. Um, how many will there be? Uh, who will convene them? Who's going to lead them? Is there anything you can share to uh, kind of flesh those out? You want to start? You want uh, to? Let me just start. I, I first uh, mentioned the coordinating committee. So the, the council and school board are establishing a campus coordinating committee. And if you think of this is one city project, but it has two main tracks to it, which is a school procurement process and an economic development process. So the coordinating committee is designed to, on a regular basis, keep those two tracks uh, working in, in line with each other on schedule, on design issues where one project will impact the other, on public communications, on outreach, on, on uh, public input into the process. So those are some of the main things that the coordinating committee will be, be um, integrating it as, as the project goes along. In addition to that, there are special areas of, of work that we're engaged in. So, um, and these are the task groups. So um, working very closely with Fairfax County, UVA, Virginia Tech, WMATA, our neighbors in short, uh, that is a task group that will have uh, uh, myself, but council members and members of the public who have knowledge and subject matter expertise will be asked to, to help us on that. Uh, the marketing uh, piece, as we're taking this, the 10 acres of land to market, uh, we have a task group that we're standing up to help us uh, reach out to the development community to make sure we get the, the best um, visibility for this project and quality and quantity of responses. Um, uh, so those are, those are two uh, examples of what those task forces will be. The task groups will be more informal. They'll be he there to serve the city council, to serve management, to help us resolve problems as we're going through the process. And we, we on the school side are going to, um, we haven't identified specifically what the task teams are going to be that are associated with that coordinating um, committee yet. Uh, I know that there's a lot of work that we're going to do sort of as, as Wyatt described, sort of in running through the middle, we've got the school on one side and the general government on the other. I think there's going to be a significant number of task committees that will come out of the school side, but maybe not necessarily with the coordinating committee around curriculum and instruction, around building uses um, and the like. But there, there may be some that we would then roll into the coordinating committee as well. I would imagine communications might be one of them. Use, building use might be another. Um, uh, transportation, sort of that would make some sense as well. Um, and just as a sort of an aside um, that came up, it's come up a couple of times now, and it's sort of that, that place where economic development meets school and, and sort of massaging that area, if you will. Um, we, we have, as part of our uh, conceptual RFP, asked that whomever was going to apply um, have a commercial architect on their team so that they could also help influence um, the, the commercial and the school from the perspective of that we're supportive of each other. Um, so I wanted to, to throw that out there as well. We'll go here, then we'll go to the back. Hello. Um, I had a couple questions, but I'll start with, um, on the economic development side, the fact that you're waiting um, till after the school construction is built, and I was wondering what sort of um, framework you're building in as far as flexibility if you're getting proposals um, now, but not planning on building until a year, you know, a couple of years out. What sort of um, the fact that economics are going to change and all that kind of stuff. Right. What kind? Of, what are you thinking about as far as um, allowing for flexibility in that? You've uh, you've put your finger on a key dimension to this project, and that is that the economic development piece can't begin until the new school is completed and occupied. And at which point, then the old building can be demolished, and that's the site where the economic development would take place. So um, from, from a risk perspective, um, that period of time where we've issued the construction bonds, um, we've executed an agreement, uh, but that two-year period where markets could change, uh, where a whole host of macroeconomic things could influence what, what ultimately happens there on that economic development piece, that is sort of the window um, in terms of, of the risk that we're trying to manage with this project. Um, so in terms of the entitlements, 
Uh, the developer will likely want some flexibility in the entitlements that they get, uh, that if there are market changes, um, that there's a process by which they can change their uses to adapt to that market reality. Um, the city, on the other hand, will be negotiating for as much certainty and assurance that what they say they're going to deliver, they're going to deliver. And that's going to be a tension point in those negotiations. Um, we think that that two-year window, though, in terms of what's kind of normal out in the market, um, it's not extraordinary uh, to have that period of kind of a lag between uh, taking down a property and going through your final building permits and financing and all that uh, that a developer needs to obtain. But it is a key point that um, that in the comprehensive agreement, um, that's going to be there, there will be key terms that will address uh, the potential for market changes and, and how the city will protect its interests. Let me go to the back and then uh, back for Mr. Lamar. So um, I noticed that on the financial piece, it talked about releasing $10 million or 8% of that $120 million in the spring of this year. And when I look at the plan, it shows that we're really spending most of this fiscal year um, or through the end of this calendar year um, putting out and receiving proposals. Why does the community need to take on $10 million in debt when we don't have anything to spend it on? Well, that the money will be spent. It will be spent on architecture and engineering, and, and those are real costs that will be incurred over um, over the period up to June 2019. Uh, Peter, I don't know if you want to just pass elaborate on... on. Well, once we that, um, that part of the process, yeah, I, I think um, for for us, the the bulk of the work will begin after we down select and get the GMP negotiated um, in May of nineteen. So that that money will start moving at that point for uh, at May of nineteen. Right. The, um, we're not just getting proposals over that period. The school is being designed during that period, and so you have to pay for that architecture yeah, engineering work. It, so, so back. I'm sorry. Let me be clear. May of 19 is when we negotiate the final price. We've gotten all of the design previous from the year before, leading up to that point. So we'll start design in May of 18, and so the money will need to be used. It starting actually starting soon. Um, but in May of 18, that's when we, in earnest, start designing that building. So there'll, there'll be a whole year of design. And then in May of 19, we'll negotiate the final piece. Mr. Lamoni has the mic. I think this is on. Is, yeah, you, is they just on? need it so they can hear you in the on the TV. Oh, so. okay, sure. Thank you. Um, my question, I, I have, I have, would have a whole lot of questions, but we, the school is is uh, the the projected cost is 120 million. Will the uh, when the final. Uh, constructors or, or company that will build the school is chosen, will there be any limits on the cost limits? Uh, the reason I raise this issue is we have, uh, we have some very inflationary uh, uh, policies that have been put in place by the current federal administration. Uh, this, uh, we have a shortage of uh, construction workers due to our, our immigration policies, I think a large part. Uh, that's why we have a shortage of housing throughout the country. So, uh, and, and certain and large financial institutions who manage assets are, are talking about a surprise inflationary shock uh, in the next year or so. Uh, what kind of protection do we have against that? So, to repeat the question in the back in case you didn't hear it, I, I think, Mr. Lamoni, your question is what kind of guarantees are there um, that we don't 
overrun our costs once we've, once we've started this project. And I think that's another piece of the PPEA process that is very helpful, is that we, no we negotiate up front through the GMP. GMP is uh, short for greatest maximum price. Uh, and that GMP is negotiated in May of 19 before we even break ground. So any changes that have to happen beyond that um, are at the discretion of the school system and, and uh, that's it, that would be it. Our intention is to negotiate a, a very strong GMP with the, being very clear about what it is that we want right up front. The, the other part about the PPEA that sort of gives um, some support to making sure that we don't overrun is the way that it's structured is that any money that's saved in the process is shared savings between the design build company and the schools. So there is incentive for those design and building companies to not overrun costs, but to try to do it on time, on budget or sooner so that we can capture some savings and then share those savings between the two entities. I think there was a one in the back, sir. A uh, comment and a question. The comment is, I was there, I it was about a month or two ago when we had the meeting over at the school, on the, break, I, the breakout session that I attended was about parking. If I remember correctly, we have about 500 spots now, and we're going to 300. About 350, but 350. yes, it's still reduced sub substantially. I don't know how that's going to work. Mm -hmm. I've been now in and out of MEH and uh, Mason, I can't count. And I was just there yesterday morning for a lacrosse clinic, and I had to park. I mean, I was expecting the parking lot to be mostly empty. Mm. It was full. <coughs> and there was nothing that I could see that was going on. What happens on those nights when you've got the MEH play, you've got some adult soccer league on the turf, you've got rec basketball, you know, doing something. Mm. What's going to happen? I mean, are we going to give up band? Are we going to stop doing rec basketball? What about those parents who are coming from the Bull Run District schools or from Loudoun County for lacrosse? They're expecting to park somewhere. Mm -hmm. Can't stick them over at the Giant and relying on the retail establishment, the, the 10-acre, which is going to be mostly retail, and or something with Tech UVA Center is temporary. What happens if they go, actually, we need those spots. You can't park there anymore. Mm -hmm. You could have the best high school in the world, the, the most fabulous people would want to visit just because it's like a museum, the most wonderful place in the world. You can't park you got a major league problem on your hands. Yeah. And I, don't, I mean, and we're talking about having more kids in the school. That's part of the reason why it's getting bigger. Yeah. You can't do it with 350 parking spots. Yeah. You can barely do it now with 500. Mm -hmm. I think it is, it is something that we will continue to look at closely. We understand that there are the issues that you've raised. Um, one, one thing that I, I do uh, sort of have wonderings about and thinking about in terms of syner synergies and you've sort of talked about some of them is one with the UVA tech space and looking at swing space and working out a deal if there were a need for overrun uh, parking. Thinking about the developer that might come in if there was some structured parking that they were going to put on their site if we might be able to develop an agreement with them for overrun parking. But part of it is I, I think there is going to be some shift that we're going to have to think about in terms of how we transport back and forth. And I, I am confident just from a kid perspective, now this, the, notwithstanding the evening events and the sporting events, but, but I know with the kid perspective, we'll be able to bring down the need for parking spaces pretty substantially. If oh, we, I'm, I'm all for that. I think yeah. junior parking, I'd pay for it. I think yeah. junior parking <laughs> yeah. is ridiculous. But I, but I do get, I do but get the I'm sports about when the you, stuff that's and band and orchestra. And but I'm talking about the important stuff. I get it, I get it. And that um, is something that we're, we're paying close attention to. And the question was, we learned what about a week and a half ago that WMATA might be doing or is going to be doing the same thing. You know, Econ 101 tells you more supply might hurt our demand. Mm -hmm. And are there backup plans that maybe 120 million might be too much to take on if they do their 24 acres and there's not that many? I mean, how many more coffee shops mm -hmm. can we have? I mean, it's a great location and mm -hmm. it's going to become more and more businesses. Are, are relocating to places that are closer to mass transit. And that's a huge, ma but there is, a, there is a limit as to how much all that acreage is worth. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, all, we've known about it for about 10 days now. What happens? 
Yeah. If they do a great job and they get ahead of us, of our 10 acres, and our 10 acres end up being less valuable than, say, if they weren't doing anything. Why, you guys have talked about that. We haven't really yeah, talked about well, it. You know, um, our approach with our neighbors is, um, you know, we, A, we want to coordinate, we want to share planning. We, uh, we, we think that uh, really good outcomes can be produced if we plan together, and that's been happening. Um, we don't view it as a zero-sum equation where if they have density, that means that that drives down our value. Um, the opposite is true, that as our neighbors develop uh, with interesting and, and good uses, that actually helps uh, the value of, of what we're trying to do. Um, it is a fact that we will be ahead of them, um, so we have the opportunity to set a very positive tone uh, for development on this site, which ultimately I think you, uh, the UVA and Virginia Tech will redevelop, and ultimately the WMATA site probably last will redevelop, um, if, I, if I were to, to guess. Um, the, the coordination, I think, has been very collegial and, uh, and positive, and uh, our council members have been involved in that, our members of the EVA have been involved in that, our planning commission. Um, and there's a lot more to be done, uh, but uh, you know our view is with the uh, Wamata submission, they needed to get something in to begin a public discussion with Fairfax County. Fairfax County has a window of time where they'll accept comp plan amendments, and so Wamata did want to get in uh, before that window closed, and uh, and and they I think accomplished the goal, which is to have a good public discussion about what's possible on that site. So uh, we applaud them for that. In terms of backstop, though, I, I think, you know, thinking about it from a backstop perspective, one of the things that's been built into the plan is that if there isn't a master developer agreement in hand, by the time we're ready to break ground, we stop. That's right. Right? And so we've, we've got to, that's why our work together is going to be so vitally important and, and that we support the economic development as best we can. I have a brief comment and then a question. We talked about this uh, with the Mason Road development. We used to have a shuttle here called George. I know there were some issues with it. Um, it was here right when I started, so I wasn't here for the whole history. I mean, when I moved here. Um, but I really think that we could look at that much more carefully with some of the large businesses, developers, the apartment complexes, and create uh, a more profitable and well-used shuttle service around town that could also encompass the needs of people with disabilities and seniors. Uh, Can I repeat that just so the folks in the back? The so so the, question, the, the comment was about um, George, the shuttle service, and how maybe thinking about revisiting that once things sort of get off the ground uh, to accommodate more mass transit, more that could meet the needs of um, our, some of our elderly so folks and uh, yep town, okay I just want to make sure everybody heard the comment yeah. yep. if we you're you're on it just you want, won't hear it because it's for the TV yeah. if we want people using cars less and we're not wanting to add parking as as a part of that and we have other limits with large buses and metro but we've got these two metro stations we've got large developers and we've got points within the city where people could easily uh, locate a shuttle. I think that we could explore and create another shuttle like George was, but something that works better and if not profitable, at least um, is not um, uh, putting us um, at a loss financially. And uh, as he was pointing out, that would also encompass the needs of senior citizens who might need help uh, getting up on a bus, people who are disabled. And then I just wanted to ask a question, uh, uh, piggybacking on the question about the financing. When the money starts coming in, where will it be held? Will it be invested? Well, first, uh, just a comment on, on uh, 
transit. Um, the, the Planning Commission re recently adopted a comp plan amendment for the campus site, and this site is envisioned to be uh, transit adjacent development. And so transits are really going to be a key part of how people get there and, and move through the site. Um, the, uh, in terms of the cash flow for the project, um, we view the, the proceeds coming from the economic, economic development piece coming in sort of two different chunks. One is through the transaction, and then later through tax yield. So in terms of the transaction, those will be payments that we'll receive, and those will be sequestered to uh, help us service the debt for, for, the, um, for the high school. Uh, the tax yield, which comes on later, um, we anticipate that being what we call a, a virtual tax increment um, that we will uh, keep track of and that will also be used to offset the debt on the high school. Now between the two of them, it won't fully cover all the costs, at least that's how we've modeled it. Um, but the tax increment along with the transaction, the transaction fees will cover a significant portion of that debt service. Um, and we will keep track of that and uh, make sure that that money is going for that purpose. It, you know, it's, it's part of, you know, from the planning from the beginning, we've recognized that putting land that is currently in public use, in school use, and putting it really in, into the control of the private sector for development, um, that is a sacrifice. That is a, a loss of public, uh, of, you know, the public uses that are on that site. The rationale behind it, though, is to create a better public amenity, a new high school. And so the, the linkage between the two um, is, is critical. And, and that linkage will be kept really for the life of, of the bonds as they're outstanding. Very much for having this uh, meeting. It's great as a member of the community to be able to hear from you and, and ask questions and to provide input. Um, I'm the chair of the Environmental Sustainability Council, and I just want to put a plug out on fe February 15th. We'll be having a panel discussion on sustainable neighborhood scale development, specifically to focus on the economic development. So, if anybody's interested in the environmental and sustainability impacts, of this development and how we can have an extremely sustainable development in the future, I invite you to join that conversation. Um, my question, my comment for right now is on the high school. Um, Dr. Noonan, first of all, thank you very much for including LEED Gold and mm -hmm. Zero Energy Ready uh, in the RFP. That's extremely important. Um, I wanted to get back to the, the green space comment, though. Um, on the December 13th community event, you said that the main point of that was to raise the issue of what's missing. Mm -hmm. And in the sustainability breakout, it was tree canopy and landscaping. That was sort of the number one issue that people came to in terms of what's missing from the RFP. Um, I heard you say that you'd like to in include some language in the new RFP asking for as many trees as possible. Um, but I'd encourage you to go beyond that. Uh, I defer to my colleagues in the Tree Commission for the specific um, target. I support you know, their goal of 20% tree canopy. I'd also encourage you to think about sites, um, the site standard, site certification. Sites is a standard analogous to LEED. Mm -hmm. LEED is really for buildings with some consideration of landscaping. Sites really specifically speaks to and provides a framework for the sustainable development of landscaping. Mm -hmm. Um, why does this matter? And you noted that the school grounds or that the playing fields are one of the real challenges for a 20% tree canopy. Our, um, our, our playing fields are within 500 feet of Route 66. And as a result, the kids on those fields are exposed to higher levels of particulate matter and very poor air quality. And it's not just any students, right? It's our student athletes whose lungs are working harder <laughs> than anyone's. Um, so that's a real health risk for these kids. Um, the EPA recommends that one of many ways to protect air quality for schools is vegetation screens. Mm -hmm. um, and I suspect that that's a lower cost option than putting a dome over the playing fields. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I just want to ask you, I guess the question is, um, in the absence of a target like 20% tree canopy, how would you propose to protect the air quality that our student athletes are exposed to on the playing fields? Mm -hmm. Um, and also, would you consider a more specific target for tree canopy or pursuit of uh, sites certification? Sure. Um, uh, thank you, Corey, for, for raising that. <laughs> and you did a great job. Um, I, here's what I would say to that is I, um, 
I would like to consider the, first of all, consider the entire site, including the Henderson site, along with the George Mason High School site as one site. So if there's a way to increase the, the tree canopy on that entire site, we certainly want to do that. With respect to the particulate matter and air quality along 66, we get, we get that. We've seen the, the data that suggests that there's, the air quality is not as good. We'd like to look at some tree buffers and some tree, tree areas for that as well. Um, but I suspect part of, the, part of the solution to that will be to, wh when we get into the design phase of it, which is not the same as the design RFP, I want to clarify that. So the design RFP piece is where our, our design uh, build companies will come in and give their idea of what they think it should look like. But once we've down selected to the finalist and really are working on what that design would be, I suspect that one of our task committees is going to be some a group around sustainability and about green. And so I would I would invite you and and some any other who would like to be on that to help us think about how we might be able to explore those options. Because I, um, as I mentioned, I I'm I'm all for trees. If we can find places to put them, um, we should we should do that because it makes a lot of sense. So. Um, I'll look into the site piece that's analogous to LEED, but with um, sustainability um, from, the, from the landscape and tree piece, and maybe get some information about that. And that might be a good jumping off point for us at some point to have that conversation. Mr. Shields, if I remember correctly, the UVA Virginia Tech property, the building, is now on a $1 a year lease that they pay to the city and I believe at some point in the not too distant future, they can purchase that property for a fixed price. A um, couple of quick questions. Is the Metro rehabilitation and, and rezoning proposal to Fairfax, does that include the UVA Virginia Tech building? Uh, and, and secondly, are our conversations with UVA and Virginia Tech about bringing that building into our um, property is that debt? The uh, the WMATA comp plan amendment is for the WMATA property only. Um, it does make a lot of allusions to the university uses that are right next door, um, uh, but it is not a comp plan amendment for the UVA tech site. Um, your description of the land lease is accurate. Uh, there is, in 2021, there's an option that the universities have to purchase the property. Um, and um, uh, so that's, you know, what, four years. Um, in terms of discussions for, if, if your question is a boundary adjustment to bring that property into the city limits? Well, my question, that's, that's interesting, but my question also is, I assume we feel they plan to purchase the property at that point because it's a relatively low purchase price that we set back then. Um, are we in any discussion with them about incorporating, uh, about them moving into the metro site and incorporating that property back into our land that we have for utilization of both the commercial and the school uh, property? I, I think it's a uh, great question. Um, I can't speak for UVA and Virginia Tech in terms of what their future plans are. And um, when I have ventured into that territory, they've asked me, please don't comment on their future plans. And what we can say, though, is that they are planning for the future. And what our encouragement to them is to be think more ambitiously about your, your, your property and about your programs on this site. Um, and um, you know, we think there's a lot of exciting potential for what UVA and Virginia Tech could do on the site. Um, that was the dream that was you know, behind the Northern Virginia Center back in the 90s. Um, it's a pretty quiet campus. Uh, we think it could have a lot more activity. And, uh, and so that's really been the main impulse that we've been sending to them. And I think the response has been, been favorable. Um, so they, are in, they know all about our plans. And they're thinking about their site, um, about how they could um, have more programmatic options and more more activity happening on their site as well. Now, whether that's on the roughly eight acres that they control today, or whether that includes the Wamata Wamata property, 
I have I don't know the status of those of that thing, um, but it certainly seems like that would be an available option for them. <clears throat> Mr. Lamont. With respect to the prospective uh, development on the, on the 10 acres of the road that have to be, one of the key technical issues is the uh, transportation uh, rearrangements that will need to be made, particularly on Route 7. Uh, I know VDOT is. <laughs> Uh, VDOT, VDOT is, is uh, as I understand it, plans to close the, the one entrance between uh, uh, between Haycock and and the area further further west of there, uh, and and yet the school as well as the as any potential development that envisions a a uh, entrance and exit uh, for further further down. I don't know what issues there are on Haycock, but what uh, are the developers, uh, it seems to me the developers are, are going to put a contingency that that uh, VDOT has to approve that before they will go ahead. Well, how do you plan to deal with that? Uh, it's a really important issue. Having full access off of Route 7 creates a great deal of value, and so that's something that the, the city desires. Now, BDOT has a, a process for that. It will require a waiver because of its proximity both to the ramp for 66 and its proximity under BDOT rules to the Haycock intersection. Um, and there's a process by which they will consider a signalized intersection. It's a lengthy one. They need to know, they won't do it in the abstract. They need to do it with a concrete proposal for redevelopment. And that's been our frustration. We'd like an answer in the abstract, so we can sort of check that off for a critical path list. Uh, but that's not been possible. Um, as a substitute for that, however, we have had a lot of engagement with VDOT. We've invited them to our stakeholder meetings. So they're aware of our interests. And, um, and they've laid out for us what the process ultimately will have to be for that. Uh, in terms of signalized access off of Haycock, um, that is under the city's jurisdiction, and so uh, we we have control over that in terms of the Haycock approach. Well, how about the developers, though? They're going to be very interested in that issue. Right. And the value that they may be willing to, to bid on the property mm -hmm. will depend very much on an issue that's not settled. That's, yeah. How do you deal with that? Um, we have uh, Mr. Snyder. Was, what I think we will need to deal with it in terms of is as a contingency in, in the uh, in the contract. Because sure. I think S since um, I represent the city on a lot of transportation authorities and, and commissions, we are putting money and work in as a placeholder for the Haycock Road, that whole area. So we're doing this to support the development. We're reaching out to get regional and state money. And right now, it's it, the effort is to get it into the plans, and then as we go forward to find, to further work on it. So we're doing everything we can to lay the groundwork, to have the placeholders, and as the development moves forward and it's more specific, we're going to be in a position, hopefully, to use money that we'll get through this process. Yeah, I'm not talking about a money issue. I'm talking about the developers themselves. Are they going to be willing to bid for this property without that issue settled? Well, a little bit of it, right, a little bit of it depends on what they propose and where they need it. So it's an iterative process. But what we've said is the groundwork to go after money to get it when the developers and we are able to finalize exactly where they need the road and what kind of intersection. They may need it 100 yards one way or 100 yards in another way. So you're, it's a point well taken and it's in process. So thanks much. Uh, you, you talked earlier, it was kind of a lighter question, about the auditorium size. Would mm -hmm. that be big enough to have graduation ceremonies back at George Mason? Oh, that's a good question. Um, maybe. <laughs> I think it all depends on the growth of our, of our overall high school. Um, right now, we, we do have more parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles that do make their way to Constitution Hall. One of the things that we don't want to do is eliminate anybody from want it, who wants to come to come. 
Um, so it, we would limit uh, and potentially require us to do some sort of ticket um, like some schools do. I'd prefer not to do that if we didn't have to. But there's not, um, there are not many high schools that graduate in their own place because of that, even, even uh, schools our size. Good question, though. Thank you for a great presentation, uh, Mr. Shields and Dr. Noonan. The RFQ went out a few weeks ago. We've received response, and it's going to be released, I believe you said, on the 31st, Dr. Noonan. It's, since it's been a while, could you just remind the community what we can expect from these? Will we see conceptual designs for high schools? What, what's going to be in these? What's in this covered, one that we're not? looking at currently? Yes. Yeah, we won't see any designs in, the, in what we are seeing currently, which is the conceptual phase. What we're seeing are design, well, there's a couple of things. One is, you know, are the, are the firms qualified to do the work? We're seeing a history of what kind of work they've done in the past. Um, we see who are their team members. We see their bios, some of the things that they've done. Uh, and then probably the most important part that we're seeing in these, so when you want to look at these online next week, if you, or this, this week coming up if you want, are, um, when it's not redacted, are their approaches to the design? In other words, what are some ideas that you might have that would be unique that would help us think about this space differently than another? And so that's where the firms are starting to differentiate or set themselves apart is through their approaches to design. Once again, once we narrow that down to three, and we have the three finalists going forward and we get into the design phase, they'll explore, explore that further. Um, so they'll tell us not only what their design approach is gonna be, but they will come up with some conceptual ideas of what the building might look like if they were selected. And then if they are selected, then we take that conceptual idea and we, as a community, begin to talk about Okay, let's really talk. Let's really see how this works and how this functions for us as a school. We don't like this. We like this, and we start to pick it apart a little bit more. Does that respond to your question? Okay. <coughs> but again, I, I don't. I don't want to stress it too much. But I, I can't say enough about the respondents that we did get. They're really excellent. So, high quality folks. We'll have this be uh, the last question, and uh, we'll stay longer to answer any questions if you'd like to continue the discussion after, after we break. Um, okay, so on the economic development side, um, my other questions were sort of about um, how you're prioritizing um, zoning and what happens there as far as use. Um, as far as like on the housing side, I know there's been a little bit of talk about like affordable housing and how um, that gets incorporated, like how you're setting or will Will setting those limits be part of um, the process and how that happens? And also um, thinking about, uh, I guess, uh, businesses that go into the commercial side and prioritizing um, sort of locally owned businesses versus um, large chains and that kind of thing. So the zoning, uh, here's the plan for how we'll handle zoning, is, uh, is uh, Sooner rather than later, like this spring, uh, we would rezone the property to B2, which is the city's uh, commercial zoning. Uh, schools are by right use in the B2 zone. Um, the intention for that is to send a signal that we want um, you know, commercial uses and density on the site. The, um, as we go through this process, um, select the top ranked developer, um, and then approve um, a land agreement as, as well as, um, as the entitlements. At that point, then the city will have applied a new zoning uh, regulation for the 10 acres site, which will, be, which will be based on the conceptual plan that the developer has uh, worked out with the city and that we're in agreement with. So then that, that entitlement will give the, the developer guarantees but it will also lay out the conceptual plan, and if they choose, if they desire to change that conceptual plan, they need to come back to have that uh, change uh, approved by the city council. That is the plan for how entitlements will be handled. Um, 
you had asked earlier about what about market changes. So that's another area where the developer is going to want a little bit of flexibility likely um, and the city will want a guarantee of, of performance in terms of the plan has been presented. And so that will be uh, something that will get worked out both in the, the comprehensive agreement and in the entitlements. And the two should complement each other. Yes. <clears throat> Out, and if you want to keep updates on the project, the email address will get published. But not too much. <laughs> well, Mr. Stevens has one last well, just question. Just to follow up on, on your comment, uh, as part of the planning process, there'll be something called the small area plan process, which mm -hmm. will occur over the next couple of months. And uh, that'll be another opportunity for people to provide public input on uh, specifications that could go into the Senator commercial development. And uh, thank you, Mr. Stevens. Let me identify before we break the uh, members of the Planning Commission that are here today, and, and Mr. Stevens is, is on our Planning Commission, uh, Ms. Hockenberry, uh, Ms. Teets. Uh, do we have any other Planning Commission members here? Um, a key thing to understand about this whole process is, is particularly, you know, as, as we go through the initial planning, the Planning Commission has a key role in it, and then as we go through the finalizing of the development plan, the Planning Commission will have ultimate uh, a, a vote and a recommendation of the City Council, and that's a very public process uh, that we're all familiar with uh, for our land development processes. So that will occur with this. Um, thank you all for uh, coming and being with us on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, we'll continue the Sunday series. Our next one is on the last Sunday in February. <laughs> And, uh, and we look forward to seeing you there. And send us notes if you have any questions or follow-up. Will that be here? Or? Yes, that will be uh, in this room once again. Unless otherwise noted. But the plan is to have it here. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs>